Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and today we're going to be talking about the tribes of Wales. This is episode 10. And in the pre-Roman period, just as the Roman Empire is starting to move out, and specifically as Julius Caesar arrives on the scene, there are four tribes in Wales, and each one of them seems to have some sense of influence in their various areas, and they are spread across the four different cardinal points in Wales, effectively. So starting in the south, you actually have the Silures, who are a tribe that will be fairly well covered later in this series as we talk about uh, the discussions of uh, Tacitus in the Agricola, where this group will confront with the Roman government. And then if you go west, we have the uh, Dementi. They are a tribe that lives in the Pembrokeshire, West Wales area. They are specifically in that southwest corner. They have relationships with tribes in Cornwall and Devon area. So they have a lot of interrelationships. They were considered a fairly peaceable tribe, so much so that the Romans won't really have to put a military presence there, unlike with the Silurius, where they will heavily arm the area. And so that's the two southern groups. Now, if we go up to mid Wales, we end up with the Ordevais, which again are another hostile tribe that we will hear a lot about, especially in the early Claudian period, because they're a part of the uh, confrontations that happened there. And then finally, the ones that are closest to where the so called origin of the Druids is from, which is Anglesey. Uh, these guys all lived in the northwest corner of Wales, and they're actually called the Decangli. And that group is is a fascinating one as well, simply because of the confrontation between them and Rome and how it kind of goes from there, which I think is quite fascinating to sort of see the confrontations that happen between the different tribes and how they kind of coalesce and act around the Romans. And interesting how they get covered so much. And these were the the Deca Angli, the Ordovice, and the Silures are the three main tribes in Wales. They're the main ones that will cause the problems for the Romans. And they appear to have become an entity sort of in the late Iron Age, at least as far as we know, but that's hard to say. And they, simply because we don't have evidence one way or the other, we just have what the Romans have told us. The big problem, of course, for the Deca Angli is the fact that they were protecting the Druids on Anglesey, and that will become a, a, a point of contention, especially around the Bol- revolt of Boudicca in the early 100s AD, or late 100s AD, when part of the, the reason why Boudicca is able to do what she does is because the Romans are off trying to stamp out uh, the presence of these Druids. And we're going to talk about the Druids a little bit in a couple of episodes, and we're going to go through some of their belief systems and why some people think that they actually originate from Britain rather than from the continent. So that's part of uh, each of these tribes, kind of gives you a, a faint brush of what they are. Now, how would these tribes have probably gotten formed? Well, in the late Bronze Age, as the Bronze Age collapse occurs, One of the things that happens is elites stop being so elite, as we mentioned last week. And one of the aspects of that that we see is that there's much more communal natures of things. So in a place called Flangme, uh, they have found a area which was set up by early Iron Age Celtic tribe or Celtic groups. And there was roundhouses and various other things. But I think the most interesting aspect of it is the fact that they found uh, feasting areas. And these include things like uh, keeping and protecting or setting aside the forelimb of pigs, in so much so that there's actually quite a lot of evidence of it. And the reason why we know this area was complex and it was a long-lived landscape is because of the amount of finds that were found there. Everything from the post holes of the various housing communities 
and the settlement activity, as well as things that they found in the, the Bronze Age, going back to a great white shark tooth, which was deposited in a post hole, which is something that they did in Britain and other areas. A lot of times it is perceived as being something of a luck item or possibly something of a worship item where you've set something in the base of a post hole. Uh, we don't obviously really fully know why they would do this, but it, the assumption is it had to have something to do with ritual because it's such a random thing to do. I mean, why would you put a shark tooth at the bottom? And likely they weren't expecting them to be kept, you know, forever. But it would be a way possibly to kind of bless your house, for lack of a better word. But if we look at what was found at this site, a lot of pigs and considerably more pigs than any other uh, domesticated animal. In fact, there was found so many pigs that there was a lot of questions as to whether or not these pigs were local. The reason being is that pigs are not generally an animal that you herd. They don't create massive areas of travel. They they generally stay in one spot. Even today, you can see that with pigs. I mean, they're, they're happy enough to live in a farm and to have uh, small pens. And they're not really animals that are meant to graze and wander across fields and plains. And because of that, because of that upbringing, it seemed unlikely that they would have been traversing great areas to get there. Fascinatingly, though, it turns out the archaeological evidence and the radiological dating that was done shows that these pigs generally did not come from the local vicinity. They'd actually been somehow transported to Llanmes from elsewhere. And that in and of itself is amazing to think of in the early Iron Age. Secondly, that a lot of these pigs were dead before they got there. And the reason why they say that is because they actually cut their heads off because heads had a limited nutritional value, had limited amount of things that you need, they would be the first thing you would get rid of. So if you're cutting those off, you've killed the animal before it got there. So if that's happening, that means that they were traveling as dead carcasses, which means, of course, that can be problems with like infestation or uh, food sicknesses because of the fact that they might go bad. So the fact that they did this much effort shows that there's some reason that was behind it, which had a lot of powerful meaning to these people. So what were they doing? Well, they were feasting. That was pretty obvious from the amount of animals that were being uh, found there, at least in parts. But interestingly enough, the one part that wasn't being feasted on, or at least largely wasn't being feasted on because of the amount of evidence that they'd found, was the right front hoof the actual forelimb of the animal on the right side was being kept in larger amounts than any other part of the pig which probably shows that these were being used as a sacrificial thing in all likelihood now why it's the right forelimb nobody has a clue on that one of course but the reality of it is is that most of these animals were coming from such a large distance it's really interesting to see how much meaning that must have had. Because why would you travel, you know, up to 20 kilometers, let's say, to bring a pig to this location? Would it have been a holy site? Is there a reason outside of that? Is there some sort of communal reason? And this is kind of where the questions start to be raised. And, and this is where we can kind of point to the tribal origins of things. The one thing we've talked about a lot is about the idea that hill forts became a massive project. They weren't just something that were put together by a couple of people and a hoe, you actually had to have quite an effort to make a hill fort strong and make it lasting. And this would be a similar situation. You just didn't find this amount of animals grouping in a location without a good reason. So obviously we were finding evidence of communalization. And that not only that, but it was communalization without an elite. Because of course, as we said earlier, previous to this, the elite have disappeared or at least largely disappeared in the record of the archaeology. So that being the case, the Iron Age is when things in all likelihood went from being your local family, your extended family and you being your tribe to possibly being neighbors to being a wider community. And when we look at the four tribes that are in Wales, they are covering a massive distance at that time. Their areas that they cover are miles and miles in length. 
So they're not just a small little group. This is, if it was later in the history of Britain, these groups would be called kingdoms. And in all likelihood, they were after a fashion like a kingdom from the early Anglo-Saxon period in the fact that you probably had a group of paramilitary people who were called out much like the the military groups and the high kings and that kind of thing that they had in that era. Uh, you probably had specialist ranchers and that because you couldn't have had this amount of pigs without having specialized people who could deal with them. And if you have specialization, then what you have is you have a much bigger group because specialization means that you're can that you can just spend time on one thing. And in a society where you have a small group, you can't do that because if somebody specializes, that means somebody's not able to work on the farm. They're not able to grow food. They're not able to help with, you know, moving cattle or whatever it is, you know, or making clothes. They're just literally with that specialization. So the fact that they had this amount of pigs shows, again, that we have a specialization going on likely to try and corral all these animals because to have 9,000 forelimbs that they had in this site, you're talking about an incredible amount of live animals and dead animals being brought to a location and managed. And you don't do that in a small scale. You have to do it on a massive scale with a lot of people at this point in time. So the amount of fauna in the area alone would force that particular situation. So it's, it's fascinating to kind of see because what it does is it gives us the concept that now all of a sudden we're seeing a tribal nature. We're seeing groups gathering together. We're seeing evidence of burials of military men and of specialization within these groups and defensive walls and defensive ditches and all of these things showing that not only is there this communal tribal growing together, but that there's conflict between the various tribes. And in that conflict, we're having to create defensive industries to try and protect. So what does this mean later? It means that it explains why there is a group of Britons in Gaul fighting the Romans at that period of time because they would have been fighting each other and that would have given them the training and the ability to be able to carry forward aggressively on that issue. So as we talk about these groups, the one thing we don't have a great image of, and unfortunately it would be really nice if we did, and we do get minor perspectives, you know, the the suspositions on why a particular group has curly hair or specific natures of that or the fact that the silures were more militant and much better warriors than some of the other ones thus the reason why they gave the romans all this trouble but we don't really have a good idea of what the welsh tribes were doing what kind of their day-to-day activities were and how much that reflected on them as individuals obviously we don't have an idea of, of family groups and kind of what that social economic relationship would have been. We only have kind of a a peak that we get through archaeology. And again, we're reaching this area where there isn't a lot of writing about the circumstances. A lot of the connections that the Romans had and the Gauls would have had with Britain would have been the Southeast. So you don't have a concept of what's going on in the Western edges of the, of the, the countries you don't have a concept of what these people are up to. We only have the image of the fact that they militarized, that there was a lot of effort to try and protect their land and their property and probably their animals from raiding, from other problems. So there isn't this image of an overall society. And the only kind of version of that we do end up with comes out of the Romans and their descriptions of the Druid classes and the leaders of the Uh, tribes that they run into later on and starting next week we're going to get into this more because we're going to start to now we're going to bring in julius caesar we're going to cross into the main you know from roman heavily written areas of the mediterranean into britain and we're starting to get a window on the soul of what the british population is like what they're doing but it's a biased one and of course, because of that, we're going to get a very hostile viewpoint. We're going to get a, either we'll get a hostile viewpoint in one case, in the case of Julius Caesar, or we might get a back slapping sort of, oh, look at these noble savages living in this 
you know, savage environment and how much better they are morally because they're living as savages and not as us decadent Romans. And that comparison will come as well, especially from the Senate class who hate the emperor at the time. And we'll get this whole discussion of these kind of things. Uh, but they have to be encapsulated within what we understand is going on in the outside world. Now, to kind of set up the stage for Julius Caesar... So, as we talked about last week, there was a massive amount of trade that was going on between southern Britain and Gaul, and this export and import of goods became a way for Gaul to become rich. It became a target, specifically of Julius Caesar, who at that time was a part of what they call the Triumvirate, which was three men, uh, himself, Pompey, and Crassus, who had developed themselves into leaders of Rome, uh, against actually the Republican ideals of Rome and against the way government had gone prior to that. But about, effectively, they became strongmen who dictated to the government of the time what was going to happen, and they basically led things. And it, as I said, it was totally against what the Roman Republic was about, which had at the time two consuls normally, and then they would give dictatorial powers to someone when there was a war so that they could basically do what needed to be done to win the war. But then it was supposedly expected that you would then give up that power and then turn it back over to the Roman Republic. And Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus are the ones who don't do that. They don't give power back. They start to seize more and more. And they start to centralize the power within themselves. And at this point, we have Julius Caesar carrying on a what some have called an illegal war, uh, against the uh, Gallic tribes. Effectively, I think he's padding two things. He's One, he's padding his pocketbook because as you defeat these tribes, you get to take all their gold and all their mineral wealth and all their real wealth and sell them off as slaves and have a big triumph to make you look good. So to give you again a bit of background on, on a triumph, a triumph is something that you do in the Roman period to celebrate your victory in some military fashion. So if you've defeated a tribe, what would end up happening typically is the leader of the tribe and, and some of his various hangers on, and then some of their really odd people in the Roman eyes would then be brought with them to Rome. They'd be treated really well until such time as they had their triumph. They would actually be treated excellently. And then in the triumph, they'd be decorated with lavish things that sort of symbolize their, their area, usually, again, to point out the oddity uh, and the majesty or the militancy that Rome was able to beat. They'd be then paraded in a massive parade, which would be paid for typically by the person holding the triumph. And in part of this triumph, there would be money spread about to the local populace and all sorts of different things done. And at the head of the, tri of the, the triumph would be the leader who won the day. And in some cases, they even had a guy who stood behind him to remind him that he wasn't as good as, as the Republic and that, you know, he needs to remember his place. But nonetheless, you still have this big celebration of the one who won the war. And then the tribal leader that was captured would then have himself ritually slaughtered uh, in possibly in a game situation or just in an execution. And boom, bang, celebrations would continue. And so in the case of Gaul, this would happen. They would end up capturing uh, Vercingetorix, the leader of the, Rev of the group fighting against Rome, and they would bring him back and, and put him on display in this triumph. In the meantime, though, Julius Caesar is now that... So money, celebration, and as well, a big part of what becomes the natural order of things in Rome is that... If you want to be a leader in Rome, you got to win a fight and you got to win a war because that gives you street cred with the populace. Because, well, for one, Roman military, uh, when they fight wars, one of the reasons why they do it is because they start to create what they're calling colonies or colonia. These colonies are effectively uh, areas that are then set aside in the captured territory for their soldiers to retire to. And the soldiers would, of course have been raiding the area. So they're taking the booty, they're taking the women, they're taking the slaves. Uh, and then they would settle down at the end of their campaign period, you know, when their, their time is up uh, as soldiers. And then they would retire to these colony, which would be, as I said, gifted to them as land. 
And this was a big key. If you couldn't do this, you then ran into big trouble because your military didn't have a reason to keep fighting. Because that was a big part of the reason why the Roman military fought was because eventually they'd be rewarded. So a lot of times that was the end goal was to get the big score, for lack of a better word. So you had that aspect of things. Also, you're showing the public something. And what the public does is the public controls the votes in the Republic in some respects. Uh, Certain levels of the government were voted on in the Roman Republic. So if you could convince the public that, you know, hey, aren't I a swell guy? I win the wars. I bring home all the money and we look after you with all this gold and all these entertainments, because that was another big thing is they would host entertainments to try and convince, you know, the old saying of bread and circuses, you know, money and or food and entertainment. That was what the Roman victors would offer the people. So the people loved it. I mean, when men, when they won wars, it was great all the way around. It was like a national holiday, effectively. And in some cases, like in later times with the emperors, it becomes a national holiday for weeks on end. So you can imagine that this would then make people want to have more success and have more of these winning situations because not only do you get to see these exotic people in this strange land you also get the benefit from it because you're a roman citizen financially uh in entertainment as i said and also in the fact that if you're a soldier you gained land and you gained wealth so all of these reasons means that if you're a successful leader you win a fight and you do it in all sorts of different ways and typically you're trying to do it to not romans which is the other big thing. You want to fight people who aren't you. And so for this period of time, as this is going on, Crassus is fighting in the Middle East against a nation called Parthia, which is in the Iraq and Iran regions. They, Crassus loses awfully badly. (laughs) He actually finds himself very much dead and his standards, which is called the Eagles, which are in the Roman era, they look like, poles with flags on them and then they have an eagle standard at the top with the uh, with the symbols of the legion that they're with so if those get captured that's the height of disgrace it's like you know when they used to carry the flags into battles in the 1800s if your flag got captured that was a terrible thing and and if somebody captured your your regimental flag and they could put it up to kind of show how we beat you Well, it's kind of the similar thing here. To capture a standard was massively important, and it was a great big demoralizing circumstance for the Romans. It would take so much from them when that would happen. So when Crassus gets killed and these standards get stolen, it does set everything back as far as the Roman Republic's concerned, because, of course, they lost, which is always a bad thing. They lost badly, which is even worse, because they lost a full legion. And secondly, they had these standards stolen, so now morale is even lower. In the meantime, as that's going on, Pompey and Julius Caesar, who had been a part of this triumvirate with Carassus, didn't have their older uh, member now with them. They were competing at least somewhat with each other. The one thing that they had tried to do to make relationships with each other is is, uh, Pompey was actually married to one of Julius's Uh, daughters, Julia, and she had been considered to be sort of the glue that was holding the two of them together. She ends up passing away in childbirth, and because of that, I think her and the child died, that actually broke what little was holding the two of them together. And at that point, it's just a matter of time before they come to fight, and eventually they will come to blows, and Pompey will be killed, and then Julius Caesar will take over the government as his own individual, and never says the word, although it comes darn close, emperor king, um, only to find himself assassinated by the Senate shortly thereafter, and da 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 as, as you can say, that's when everything changes for Rome, because then we enter into the, uh, we go from the Republic to the Empire as Octavian moves in and then becomes Augustus. However, to get back to our original discussion, we'll get more into the Roman Republic and Roman Empire in the next episode, and especially we'll continue to talk about it going forward for a while, because, of course, Roman Britain, Roman Wales, doesn't live in a vacuum. It is affected by what's going on in the rest of the empire, and will be continually influenced by this conflict of great people 
who are fighting in and over the areas that Rome control or Rome wants. And this will develop for the next 400 years this way. In this particular case, with Julius Caesar, he is... When Crassus dies, he's in Gaul, fighting the Gauls. He eventually will decide to cross over to Britain, and we'll talk about that again next week. And when he makes that decision, it then becomes a big part of what comes next. And what comes next is eventually Julius Caesar will then turn his sights onto Rome. He'll do the infamous crossing of the Rubicon, which was sort of the last river where military wasn't supposed to cross. He basically, you weren't supposed to enter Rome with a military force because it was felt that that was obviously showing that you were going to revolt. And, of course, that's exactly what he does. And he comes in and, as I say, takes over Rome. Eventually, him and Pompey conflict. Pompey is killed. And, like I said, Julius Caesar takes over. But before we get there, we get to this dealings with Britain, his two invasions, if you want to call them such, and what they mean to the British people, and what they will mean going forward to the Welsh people, specifically in these four tribes that we've talked briefly about. And as I say, we'll go much further into these tribes as they conflict with, with Rome or don't, or with groups like the Dementiae, which are actually in allegiance or aren't in a position to fight against Rome. They're considered to be more of a friendly tribe. And so they obviously adapted better to Roman rule. What that meant to Roman Wales overall and how it was governed and, and where the problems were. I mean, a lot of the problems that the Romans will have with Wales will actually come from the other three tribes. And that in somewhat stems because of the area that they're in. The Dementii are very much in a plains area. They're very different sort of a population and environment than what uh, you're dealing with when you're talking about a mountainous region where the Silures and especially the Ordovice are, where it's not so simple to take them out and not so as simple to find them even. So it, it's a much different circumstance and situation. And like I said, you're going to have a lot more conflicts, but it's interesting to see how some of these tribes will make peace early and sort of become a part of Rome. They're literally just merged in as Civitas, and that will influence what comes later. It's a fascinating point, and we, as I said, we're, we're getting there. We're actually getting to the point where we're talking about historical figures, historical evidence, as opposed to just archaeological evidence, which is always important to have both. Because if you have both, you get a lot closer to what probably was going on than if you have one or the other. Because we, as we know, both lead to speculation and ideas about what may happen where one person can look at it, another person can look at it, and they can come up with very different possibilities. If you have history and archaeology, it at least gives you a sense that there's some legitimacy beside what is being said in the histories because you can find evidence archaeologically. Conversely, you can explain archaeology a lot better this way. Anyway, until next week, I'll see you all later. Take care, everyone. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. What's up, guys? We just launched a Patreon to help us bring in some money for upgrades and advertising. There's a lot of cool tiers on there that you should check out, and you can get all the extra content for just $5 a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash distractionsmedia.